Inspired by stories of John C. Fremont's tour to the Rocky Mountains, Louis Hector Gerard bid farewell to his parents and left his Cincinnati home to seek adventure in the West. In July of 1846, with letters, cash, a pocket Bible, rifle, and a few calico shirts, he started for St. Louis, the gateway to the West. He was 17 years old. Taking notes and recording what he witnessed, Gerard wrote a book about his adventure that was first published in 1850, and it remains a classic of American literature, a wonderfully accurate account of life in the Southwest of 1846 and 1847 as he saw it. Young Lewis first appeared at Ben's Fort after 50 days on the trail. Like others, he would come and go several times in the course of his employment with the Ben St. Vrain Company, and on each return he would write about the fort's hospitality and the transition from harsh trail life to the brief enjoyment of refinements available at this island of civilized comfort. We sat down to a table for the first time in 50 days and ate with knives, forks, and plates. Lewis was assigned to company bent trader John Smith on his trading excursions to the Cheyenne camps. Traveling with Smith, Lewis was exposed to the life of a trader and its hardships. We felt with our feet on the river's edge for pieces of wood and with numbed fingers knocked the snow from them. And he also experienced its pleasures. It is strange how self-satisfied one is when safely in camp, acknowledging the grateful warmth of coals, chatting as unconcernedly as if surrounded by luxuries. Lewis spent considerable time in the Cheyenne camps and left an excellent record of what he observed, how trade was conducted, his kind treatment, life in the camps, and his attraction to a young Cheyenne woman named Smiling Moon. To replace the worn out pants he had worn for many months, a Cheyenne woman made and presented to him his first pair of buckskin pants. On his return to the fort, after a particularly grueling winter day of travel, Lewis took full advantage of what the fort had to offer. Only when paint was turned in the corral behind the fort to chew dry hay, and myself with numb fingers gradually thawing in the long, low dining room, drinking hot coffee, and listening to Charlotte, the glib-tongued sable fort cook, retailing her stock of news and surmises, did I feel entirely free to throw off care. Shortly following, did I sit by the brightwood fire in the clerk's office, puffing a Mexican shuck cigarillo, until dinner, tobacco, and great change from cold to warmth threw me in a doze. Lewis also gives us one of the better descriptions of the fort. I arose early in the morning, and going on top of the fort, had a good view of the Spanish peaks to the northwest, apparently 15 miles distance. In reality, 120. There was a billiard table and a small house on top of the fort where the bourgeois and visitors amused themselves. In the clerk's office, a first-rate spyglass with which I viewed the caballeta coming from the grazing ground seven miles up the river. In the belfry, two eagles of the American bald species looked from their prison. One evening they were let loose, one escaped unharmed, the other flew a short distance, and a Cheyenne shot and killed him for the feathers. During a fandango at the fort, Lewis gave us a better understanding of the unique status held by the Bent's black slave cook, Charlotte. During these boisterous dances, the variety of Fort's inhabitants, Indians, trappers, hunters, craftsmen, slaves, and others, would convene in the dining room. Nightly, Charlotte was led to the dance floor. She acted her part to perfection, the grand center of attraction, the belle of the evening. It was 
a most complete democratic demonstration. Lewis was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time to witness some important historical events. He was with William Bent when he received the news that his brother, the governor of New Mexico Territory, was killed during an uprising in Taos. He was also an eyewitness to the trial and executions of the revolt's leaders, and his writings remain the only primary account. He clearly stated his objections to the proceedings and the cruelty of the punishments handed down. Lewis's book, Watoya and the Taos Trail, opened a literary window for us to look back through time, and by using our imaginations, we can see some of the characters and scenes he encountered. He suffered hardships, witnessed cruelty and kindness, and experienced the wonderment of life in the wilds of the Southwest.